All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. It's super um, exciting. I'm in Wellington. Um, really excited to have Rod with us. Um, thanks for joining us. And um, I didn't think that Tech Week would be complete without talking to, I guess, New Zealand's um, one of our biggest companies, technology companies. And, you know, through growing the Kiwi Landing Pad, I get to deal with a lot of founders and meet a lot of people. And um, it's been pretty awesome watching Zero grow. And um, I thought we'd jump to the other end of the spectrum um, for for a day. Um, so ask your questions at the bottom. And I guess I'm going to hand over to you, Rod. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your background? Not really, but you'll probably make me. Yes. Uh, so hi, hi everybody. See lots of uh, people I know on the call. Um, so pretty exciting now. I think, you know, 10 years in, we're, you know, getting to a point of scale. So we just had our results last week, which is why I wasn't around for, um, for Tech Week. So, you know, we passed a hundred million annualized revenue a couple of years ago. We're now 360 million, um, over a million customers, 140,000 accountants on the platform, 500 add-ons connecting in. So we're really establishing ourselves as this global, um, this global platform for small business. And there's some really interesting tailwinds, which I think are, are quite exciting. You know, we're seeing with what's happening in, in uh, the UK, their political situation and some of the horrors we've seen in the last day or so and what's happening in uh, the US that we know that the that the benefits of globalization have not been evenly uh, distributed. So we know that large businesses aren't going to create jobs and that what what will what needs to happen is that small businesses in, in each community need to, you know people need to create their own luck, they need to create their own businesses. And what we're seeing now is these global platforms which are becoming pathways for people all over the world to start communicating with each other. And I went up to the F8 conference um, a few weeks ago in San Jose and um, what struck me right at the very beginning were Mark Zuckerberg's comments around they've done a really good job of um, building uh, relationships between friends and family but what they need to do a much better job on is building our community and looking for the common ground and it really struck me that the common ground uh, for many people is business. And if uh, operating on these global platforms, if you can get people all over the world working together, um, creating a living together, that's gonna promote really good understanding. So I think um, you know what we're seeing different from the enterprise world of the last 10 years, where you'd build up a company and you'd sell it to a US public company, we're now able to you know build internet businesses that exist all over the world and get this magic of um, being part of global economies, traveling, meeting cool people, but also living in great places like uh, New Zealand. So there's a startup of 10, Sean, how's that? It's like, where do I go with all of that? You just kind of ran with that for a bit. Um, okay, seeing as we're going down this track, um, I guess I've really enjoyed learning um, a little bit more about Zero in the last sort of six months and, and what it actually does. And so for those of us who think that Zero is just accounting software, um, do you want to talk a little bit about like why accounting um, in the first instance? And um, and then we'll get into, I guess, um, the platform that it's actually becoming for to power small business. Sure. So, so, so the reason for accounting is it is the core systems of record. So for large enterprises, you know, you have a sales team that's working with sales forces, their tools, the HR team might be on Workday, financials on Oracle, and they all, they might be some integrations that happen at some point. Whereas for a small business, accounting is that core systems of record that everything hangs off. So strategically, we knew that pretty much every small business, they had bank accounts, smart ones had business advisors, and they all have a relationship with the tax man. So they can choose to use accounting software or not, and many still use Excel, but they all have to come through it. So um, if you're thinking about a platform play, while accounting doesn't sound very sexy, it is actually that core systems of record, and then everything hangs off around the outside. So that's why we've seen um, an ecosystem of, um, of, of companies uh, that build over that. What we also have done, which is differently, you know, there's lots of lean startups where you know, you quickly build something and early on in your career before you have capital, that's really important. But once you've done a few things, then you kind of look for things with really big moats. And what's great about accounting is it's a massive build. You've got to build essentially SAP and but make it simple enough for small businesses to use. And there's really not that many um, entrepreneurs that really understand the web and have the time and the patience and the capital to, you know, um, write millions and millions of lines of code. So all of those things give pretty big moats. So if, if we could use our prior business experience and reputation to raise enough capital 
to do something really hard with big moats, that's a pretty good place to be. So accounting software for us felt like a the platform for small business. So we think about consumer as the biggest market in the world where no one likes really paying for things. And a lot of energy has been on the enterprise market. Small business is this interesting hybrid, the complexity of enterprise, the distribution of consumer, and accounting feels like that platform. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you're noticing from people actually using the Zero platform and some of the stuff that you you sort of have realized and come across recently on like people connecting and that global ecosystem of partners that we've sort of also seen build up um, in New Zealand and create a lot more companies in the network effect of that? Yeah, so the interesting thing I think for platform players is you start, uh, there's a big responsibility and a whole lot of benefits you get from everything that goes around it. So, you know, it starts off with an application which becomes a platform and then to be a definition of a platform, others need to be building on top of you, which we've done with the ecosystem. But what we also realized was the platform includes the 140,000 advisors. And this really struck me when I was up in Hong Kong recently. And um, some of, and I realized that some of our UK accountants had driven down, come down to Australia uh, to do Australian ZeroCon events where they'd met um, Asian and US-based accountants. And they were building virtual consultancy services, passing the ball to each other. So they, you know, normally you would go to a very large accounting firm, I used to do this myself, to get access to their people and country, whereas the network of accountants on our Zero directory, they're all communicating with each other and creating these sort of virtual international services, which, are, which is really interesting. I think that's really fascinating. Um, so jumping back a step a little bit, um, I've sort of looked at one of your videos online the other day and I um, there was one where you were talking about how you decided to fund Zero. Can you, um, you've obviously, you know, you're fourth time founder, so you've obviously been through the process quite a few times, but why did you decide to fund Zero the way that you did? And can you talk about like the maths and the mechanics that you actually went to to, to make those sorts of decisions? Sure, so, um, you know, most first time entrepreneurs don't, don't have any capital. So, um, you know, if you're lucky, you might have some, you know, uh, some space on your mortgage that you can afford not to get paid for a few for a few months while you build something up. So, so my first entrepreneurial thing was creating a services business where, you know, we effectively had to go for two or three months without getting paid because um, we, you know, we had to leave our jobs. I think we rented some computers and then um, we sold some projects and you'll do the work and put an invoice in and a month or so you get paid. And we managed to get that going, but then you're in this kind of services um, uh, treadmill, really. But through that services experience, we got a whole lot of experience building complex business apps, which is very relevant to what we have now. Then when we did Aftermail, that was uh, then I, um, so my first real business was Glazier, which was a consulting business, uh, New Zealand's first Microsoft development shop, really. And that, that uh, keeps going now is Intergen today. Um, uh, when we sold that, that, you know, gave me, um, you know, you buy your first house and your first stupid cars and that sort of stuff. So, because I didn't have a mortgage, I could afford to not work for a few months. So our next business was Aftermail. And with that one, we were building a bit of intellectual property. And um, pretty much all of the founders of that, and there's quite a few of us, uh, we all p pitched, pitched in and did sweat equity. So we were most of us were in a position we didn't really have to get paid for the first six months. So that allowed us to build up the first product and then we got to some sales. What we did actually kind of early on was didn't really matter how much money we got for our first sales. So if you look at the the, um, the P&L of Aftermail, which we sold after two years, but we actually managed to go and sell a whole lot of, of, of deals. So we went and talked to five government departments and five large corporates and said, um, hey, we have this email archiving software. You guys give us 20 grand. It's probably worth 50 grand, but for, for $20,000, uh, pay us when it's done. There's no risk. There's no support charges. Um, uh, give us the opportunity to you know, get this in, and if you're happy, pay us 20 grand. So we did that. So we sold 10 deals, which gave us 200, 200 grand worth of bookable revenue, no cash, because we had to then you know, get our what we thought was version 0.9, but was really probably version 0.2, and then quickly iterate it through a course of a few months, get it in there, and then and then they paid us. And that gave us um, some really good references, some good case studies, allowed us to essentially fund building a product, not with cash. Eventually, we did get some money in, and then we kept building the, building that business up. So 
one of the things that I learned was um, once we were getting to about two hundred thousand dollars of deals a month, um, your costs would quickly get up to that because you're hiring people to implement and build software. So we sort of got up to two hundred grand of revenue, and um, and so you quickly get up to almost two hundred grand of expense because you're investing as fast as you can. But you realise when you're selling enterprise software, you know you have to you you, you sell it so you might book the revenue, but um, you then you've got a month so you can start implementation. You have an implementation phase, then they'll um, go through a certification that it's all done, and then give the bill to accounts payable, and you might get paid three or four months later. So you once we got to two hundred grand of revenue, we actually needed six hundred grand of cash to fund the business. And that was a really big lesson about working capital. So our first angel investor, we got a million dollars um, from a property investor. And he was a first time angel, which is very common. Um, that, uh, you know, that million bucks wasn't really to do r and It was really just to fund working capital. And that was a big lesson for, um, uh, for zero. And then we got to a point where we either had to go and raise a huge amount of money and, and go big or, or, or sell the business. And at that sort of, um, you know, two to three million of revenue is quite a magic point. It proves a few things, shows there's demand. And then we had a decision to go and raise a whole lot, of, whole lot of money and really go for it, or we could sell the business. And with that business, the goal was never to build a long-term business. It was to basically sell it quite quickly, and um, which, which is what we did. And that capital I got from that went straight into zero and got that started. And then with zero, um, I think with Aftermar, we had like 25 people when we sold it. With zero, the business plan called from 50 for day one because we were doing such a big build. If you have 10 developers, 10 testers, some salespeople, it quickly added up to about 50 people. And that's half a million bucks a month. Say so you needed three years to build the product, you need $15 million. At that time, probably the biggest New Zealand venture capital round was two to three million. Um, we just come off the back of selling Trade Me, so we probably could have raised money in the West Coast, but we would have sort of had a $25 million valuation maybe, and half the business would be owned by VCs. So we followed what um, Jeff Ross did with 42 Below. They'd um, told a big story about their uh, uh, Bacardi brand, which was outrageous at the time, but um, sorry, their, uh, their gin brand, but uh, Bacardi brought them and they had a reasonable result out of that. So we were able to follow that playbook and tell a big story and we raised our $15 million on the New Zealand Stock Exchange at a $55 million uh, valuation, which everyone thought was crazy at the time because we weren't worth that. But we were saying, um, you know, give us $15 million, this idea, this team, and it's a, it's a punt, but it, but it could pay off. And, um, you know, thank goodness it worked or we would have had to move to Mexico. Awesome. Thanks. So a lot of information in there to um, unpack. I'm getting all of these texts from people who are listening. They're, they're like all over the country and they're getting images of clowns. Thanks, Simon. Um, I'm sick as well, so excuse me for coughing and spluttering. Um, let's jump into scale. So what are some of the le uh, lessons you've learned from going from like, you know, 50 to 100, 100 to, you know, 500, 1,000, and now almost 2,000? Um, very um, different scaling lessons um, in terms of the like adding team and, and growing out the product roadmap and all of those things. Cool. Well, there's a there's a chart in our um, our earnings report, which if you look at the Zero Investor site, download the PDF from our earnings from last week, and there's a growth curve that shows you know the uh, up and to the right to get to a million subscribers. And what's interesting is we've added you know 300 and something thousand in the last year, and half a million subscribers in the last two years. So five years ago, I remember at our annual meeting standing on stage at 50,000 customers and and said to investors, um, imagine our business with a million customers. And we, you know, people thought, oh, well, that's pretty bold saying that, you know, good, good on your jury, that's kind of good ambitious stuff. But we had to do that because um, we knew that if we were successful and we felt we would be, we had to really front load the infrastructure build. So while I'm super proud of us hitting a million customers, I'm more proud of us onboarding half a million customers in the last two years because that's the investment we build. So once we had that vision of a million customers, that was very clear for us to go and do all the investment we had to do for scale. If we didn't do that, maybe we were really successful and we got to um, a million customers, but they'd have a shitty onboarding experience and that would end up burning customers in the straightaway anyway. 
So I think that's where these big moats are quite interesting. So raising a huge amount of money, so we've raised over 400 million with zero, but that's allowed us to have three or four years of building a team now up to 1,700, so we could seamlessly and happily onboard um, all of those customers. And um, that was a really big lesson. So people didn't understand it when we said it five years ago, but now you look back and you go, oh, now I understand why you're talking about a million customers. But of course, these things have to work out or that would have been a, a very horrible experience. So let's talk a little bit about like, so you've got your a million customers, which is a, you know extraordinary milestone. So how do you 10X that given that you've just sort of can keep 10Xing everything that you're doing from the initial sort of 50, 50 people that you brought on board? frustrations we have is this stuff takes a uh, much longer than you would hope and um, you know one of the things we would have liked to have done is um, you know do new services the whole of new services we like to build but three years ago it became clear that the investments that were happening in the public cloud with um, Azure AWS Google Compute meant that we had to get on top of that public cloud so that as, as um, machine learning and AI was commoditizing, we had access to that technology inside the, inside the same data center. So we could just turn stuff on. So, you know, I think as a founder who's disrupting, you're always paranoid about being disrupted yourself. And again, I think as a founder, you have, you're empowered to make those really hard decisions. So a big decision for us was to sacrifice features for probably two years while we went through this huge migration project to get onto AWS. And we still probably released more software over that time period than our big incumbent competitors. But for me, it was sitting on hands for two or three years while we're doing this huge amount of work, which didn't actually show much difference to the end customer, but positions us hugely. So those are the really big decisions that um, you kind of have to make, um, but it puts you strategically into a, a really um, strong place now going forward. And I've completely forgotten your question. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Too. You're probably quick on your own question as well, I suspect. <laughs> yep. Um, so I guess, um, you know, the Kiwi Landing Pad, um, you know, helps Kiwi companies um, expand into the US market. And I think this is really cool as an example um, of things going full circle. So Zero was actually our first resident um, at the Kiwi Landing Pad, I think like six or seven years ago. And um, so I guess just kind of focusing on the US, you know, what I've noticed, um, my small amount of time there, three years living in San Francisco, um, the US is an incredibly hard market to crack. And um, can you talk a little bit about like, what you've learned from, from doing business in the US, um, I guess with Zero and other businesses as well? Yeah, so, so we, we get a lot of commentary from the armchair experts about, hey, why isn't it going faster in the US? But, um, you know, we're actually doing pretty well, we're about 90,000 customers. You don't get the, you know, it depends what your sales model is. If you're just selling things online and um, uh, there's a whole lot of virality around that then maybe you're in a really good position But most sort of complex things you have to do hand in hand to hand combat in your first few years. So Our scaler in the US is not the size of the market It's the number of salespeople we have because that's the early part of the market. It's hand to hand combat It's winning accounts getting their first five to ten customers. The, the accounting industry is really conservative there They haven't had, had a lot of um, innovation in the cloud at all um, but those are just environmental factors, but we're kind of in that hand-to-hand -hand combat phase. The, the thing you've got to do then is to jump it into scale. So the good forward indicators of what we're doing there are the deals we're doing with banks, you know, the Wells Fargo's, the Capital One's. So as you, um, as you achieve more and more of those beachhead um, uh, kind, kind of jobs and tick those things off, then you get the right to have these bigger opportunities so you can get breakout economics. The other thing that's you know really obvious for Kiwi companies is you don't have the right to hire the A-team on, on day one. You want to get the best people you possibly can. And the very first people you get will probably be uh, the visionaries in that industry who are looking globally for what's happening and want to get on the bus of the next new big thing. But um, that's, a, that's a really, you know, they're really cool people that do that, but they're probably not going to be your long-term managers. So your first staff are going to be those enthusiasts who are passionate about it, have good networks. You're going to, you're going to find them at the trade shows and they're going to find you online because they're looking and seeing you know, what, what innovations are happening inside their space. And then as you get more and more experience, you start attracting that talent that really knows how to scale. And it's really difficult when you're kind of a weirdly funded New Zealand company 
competing in San Francisco against a bunch of the big brand private companies that are hoovering at hundreds and hundreds of people. So, um, you know, we've got through that. And then what we realized was it would be difficult um, and just ongoingly difficult to be fighting in San Francisco the whole time. So we decided once we'd sort of, you know, got to some milestones, we would then try to build our long-term team outside of San Fran. So we picked Denver, and I think we've done a good job now at hiring and attracting the best talent in the industry because we've hit enough milestones and centering that in Denver where you're going to have, you know, we still have very loyal staff and great staff in San Fran and we'll still have them there, but it's much easier to build a team and a culture uh, um, around Denver. So we've done that transition now and we'll um, continue to invest around that team and, you know, we don't need to grow our San Francisco presence massively. We'll just sort of keep that bubbling along at probably 100 people or so. Do you want to talk a little bit about, like, what, one thing I noticed with New Zealand, if you've got a 4.5 million person market and you create, like, quite an innovative technology solution, your ability to pull levers can actually impact the entire market, whereas in the US you've kind of got 52 different markets and 300 million people. How does that sort of impact growth and, like, the agility of the market? Yeah, so when we started, we thought, you know, um, so what was us doing it from such a small market? And I love the little example. I don't know if the mass is right, but say you're sitting in Boston and you want to get to four and a half million people, you drive for an hour. If you want to get to five million, you drive for an hour and 10 minutes. Whereas if we want to get to five million people, you have to export, you have to be away from the family, you're going to have, have enough money to be able to do that. So you have the governance to raise the money. So for us, it's really difficult to jump to that five, that, that total addressable market of over five million. Um, so we have to build export businesses right from day one. What is interesting is that though in a small watering hole you do get network effects that are very difficult to get in a larger market. So for us now with a third of all businesses on the platform, you know, we have more small businesses than any other large enterprise, you can actually make stuff happen and that's hugely fun. So in our example, while you know it might have been easier if we started with a much bigger market. Is that there is actually benefits for us being in a small market where we get the experience of those network effects and that influence to drive outcomes that could be really good references and case studies for overseas. So we've just done um, a little bit of research on the Australian market and I know that you guys have actually had quite a lot of success over there as well. Um, for us what we've seen is Kiwi companies typically um, sort of fail or really struggle to expand to Australia. Um, and I actually just visited your office in um, Sydney. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you tackled that market? Um, and I guess the example there sort of just to flow on is when I was talking to your CFO the other day, um, he was like, you have to think about Sydney and Melbourne. There's 4.5 million people in just the metro urban area of both Sydney and Melbourne and then if you look at New Zealand so you've got a concentrated mass in a highly competitive market like three hours away and we were like well why aren't Kiwi companies expanding there and how do you actually do that um, successfully? So, so we've had, um, I built up some early experiences in Australia with Aftermail and what, you, what we found is unsuccessful is Kiwis just going past and doing drive-by shootings. Um, you know you've actually got to commit to the market and the best thing is having um, Australians or New Zealanders, they look like Australians because they've been there for a long time driving your business. So my experience is Australians hate buying off Kiwi companies. So what we did, so we learned that with Aftermail and once we put um, Australians in as the front of our business, it went much better. So with that experience, what we actually did with Zero was we went to the UK first. Part of that was that UK VAT was much closer to New Zealand GST, so it's actually easier to do that. And UK is a really exciting market, you know, we've got the Kiwi Mafia there, so it's usually pretty good to get meetings. And while it's expensive and all those things, you can actually cover large bits of population pretty easily with, with day trips. So the UK has always been a really good market, but it's really hard because you have no overlapping days, um, you know, a time during the day. So once we had the UK, we came back to Australia with that UK experience and we were seen more of a, as a global company than just a New Zealand company. In hindsight, though, and it's interesting, we see a lot of our partners saying, oh, I'm going to go to the US. Like when you add the US to the UK, you, you do then become 24 seven or you know, 24 by six and a half. And um, uh, it's, it's a big toll. And you look at the growth that's going on in Australia and it's an easy flight away and you can go there and back in a day. I think the Australian market's super interesting and certainly for FinTech companies where you have quite a sophisticated banking network over there and lots of Kiwis in those banks that, um, you know, when I first 
started planning zero and I was flying around the world. I said, you know, I'm just going to do a great New Zealand and Australian business. So I wouldn't have to do all the massive, massive trips. And there's a huge amount of, of appeal looking at that. But, um, but then I was on the board of trade when we sold that and I, and I realized to beat Sam, we'd have to do it globally. So there we are. Zero became a global business after trade me. Competitive uh, competition, I love it. Um, just lastly, on this markets thing. So one thing we've been noticing um, lately is, you know, Kiwi companies aren't just landing in San Francisco; they're landing in other markets. And um, what do you think of like doing the US or doing more of like a Commonwealth strategy of like kind of choosing cities in Australia, Canada, London, New Zealand, and sort of those differences and where people can focus, like how hard is the US and like how do you kind of make that decision? It's obviously dependent on the business, but do you have any guidance for other people? Um, yeah, I mean, it does depend on the business. Um, I think we have a lot of choices now, like the US is very hard. I think it's fine for us, like, you know, everyone's gonna use an accounting software, but um, I mean, maybe it's cause I've been going there so much. I'm kind of a little bit bored of those places where we're starting to do a bit more stuff in Asia and that's you know that's so exciting and you know we're doing a lot more in hong kong a lot more in singapore i i'm really interested in singapore actually i think that's a really interesting gateway to parts of asia it's an easy flight there's a good expat community there and it's just a bit more interesting you know food's more interesting all that sort of stuff so um you know i reckon those businesses are you're looking at those parts of the world are actually really interesting for some new things and what we're seeing is in the business software market, they're becoming increasingly more sophisticated. As everything is globalized, there's probably more of an opportunity there because they're catching up faster. So the speed that we've been able to get our Singapore office up and running and then add bank feeds from the you know the biggest Singapore bank, the biggest Hong Kong bank is really quite amazing. So um, I think we should, you know, I, I certainly, if I was doing it again, and just because of all the travel, I really think about Australia. That's a good big market. Doing Australia well, I think, is a really good focus for the next stage of New Zealand companies. And, it, you know, it's basically Sydney and Melbourne. And then I'd think about places like Singapore and Hong Kong, um, which are becoming part of that market anyway. So we have quite a lot of questions coming through. So I'm going to jump to some of those before finishing up with some of my ones. Um, so first one from Simon Pound. Um, it's quite funny, the commentary with all of these founders going on. So interested in hearing about getting capital to um, for a business going. Seen you talk in the past about how you went public so early as there wasn't venture of private options at the time. Is it a must? Wait. Was it really hard for you going public um, with zero? And... Wait, what is this question? I might skip that one and read it again, sorry. Oh, no, so it was really hard going public. It was a lot of good timing. Just sold Aftermail, just sold Trade Me. I was on the board of that when we sold it and um, had built my profile so that, and, and 42 Below had just happened. So we managed to be at the right place at the right time. It was the right strategy for us right then. Um, then there's a whole lot of other, um, you know, since then there's been a few tech companies and uh, you know, I was at an investor briefing this morning, and um, uh, you, you know, the um, with Winyard and the, the Orion wobble, it's a it's probably a little bit harder now. There's a lot more skepticism. So the door was doorway was clearly open for a few years of people following our playbook, but a couple have faltered since then, which makes it um, probably harder. Uh, right now for that option. But what we are seeing is a lot of capital from other parts of the world that's available down here. Um, you know, so, you know, the investment we did with Peter Thiel at Lita Dalla, spending a lot of time down here, they actually quickly ran out of businesses to invest in. There's a lot of money to spend. Good ideas can be funded, no doubt. We're noticing that with sort of the, the Australian market as well. It's like there's a lot of interest in New Zealand right now from um, Australian VCs who are ma raising these massive funds and also um, with lots of Silicon Valley kind of the, with the eye on New Zealand actually wanting to spend more time here. Um, there's kind of more, more money than ever. How do you sort of advise people? Um, you know how there's money if you build a good, good business. What's your advice for building a good business so that you can actually attract some of that capital or what sort of... Um, cues should people be listening to if they're not actually finding the money that maybe they should be getting? Yeah, so, um, you know, people that, the best way to uh, raise money is to not need it or give the appearance of not needing it. Um, that's always a good trick. 
Um, so with us, we've always raised far more. We've always raised money at a surprise to the market in terms of timing and the quantity, far more than anyone would think. Um, in terms of getting started, people like people invest in people. So, you know, having building your profile, being a thought leader, and getting started and done an exit, done your first couple of businesses is the key thing. So for me, my first one, as I said, was a services business with very little capital. We sold that. Then we you know, built a product company, sold that, and then it was on Trade Me, which got sold. So you start building this track record. So that so so re-engineer that back. The best thing is to get started and do something and give people a good result. And then you're building that track record, that profile. And with each gig, you know, you get you obviously build more networks, you get more experience, and you have more of your own money. So um, I put in most of the pre-IPO money for zero was me, um, and then others. You know, like Sam Morgan and that came in uh, just before we did an IPO. And um, uh, so that means I owned a big chunk of it when we IPO'd. And as we've sold down small bits, you still, you know, still the largest shareholder. Um, you compare that to Orion, which EM had 51% and was, you know, precious about that ownership stuff. Um, and that, you know, maybe one of the reasons not going out and getting that capital when they needed it has put them in the troubles that they had over the last few weeks. So I think. You've got to separate yourself from the business, and you know having a having a smaller chunk of a larger pie is always always best, which has been kind of interesting. But the best way to, to raise money is to build that track record, which means getting out there, building profile, and building you know and having an opinion. So a lot of people, you know, um, sort of um, you know I'm pretty controversial, and people call because. Every time a journalist calls and I get an article in the paper, I'm thinking if I was paying for an ad, that's $25,000. So if any, you know, if I want a half a page in the Herald or a full page in the Herald, it's 25 grand and people don't read it. So if any journalist calls me, I'm straight on the phone. Yep, it's my job. And I'll comment, get in the paper, I'll save 20 grand. It's awesome. Good strategy. Um, on that note, um, I think... But, but, but where it translates is there's not many people doing that. It's such an obvious thing. So... There's so much silence around the big issues. So it's so with me, I've always been out there uh, talking and having an opinion because that's a, a very cheap way, an obvious way to build your profile. It's funny. I, one of the strategies we did right at the beginning of building profile around zero was we wrote a um, a paper about broadband, did it like a white paper in the zero brand and colours. I think it was called "Securing Our Digital Trade Routes," and we published that as a PDF rather than a blog. And um, I remember watching the business news on a Friday morning and Fran from the Herald was talking about the Drury report on broadband. I was like, what? Jeepers, that, that happened. And then suddenly people are phoning you up asking what the interest rates will happen. So in New Zealand, it's quite easy to build that profile, but you have to put yourself out there and do it. Um, Ryan kind of had made a joke and also said that he's admired the way you call out incumbent, incumbent competitors for doing dumb shit. Most Kiwis shy away from this stuff. Has it ever bit a new in the ass? Um, not too badly. Uh, it's funny though when the incumbents start doing it back to you because they always do it stupidly and then you can go back times 10. Um, you know, we just did that with our little billboard stunt, which was quite fun. Um, it's so interesting actually how many of our internal people are like, oh, you can't do that. But then we've had, you know, a couple of news stories and all that sort of stuff. So it's been, been good sport. But also for internal culture, if we've got a big big incumbent poking us around, our staff expect us to respond and that you know, for internal morale, it's all good things. But no, normally it's pretty good. I mean, as part of the David and Goliath strategy, you want to attach yourself respectfully. Um, so like when Stuart's numbers were just out today, so you know, I did a nice congratulatory, congratulatory tweet to them. Um, so all credit wins, credit's due. But, um, you know, once... Um, uh, you know, uh, they'll put out all of their numbers but not give you the revenue so you can't calculate ARPU. So what we'll do is make sure that we've done that work and then we'll send it around to all of the analysts so they ask the right questions. So we're pretty aggressive on when, because we understand the industry deeply, um, you know, showing all the, all the tricks that the others will use. So they just, you know, so people understand the quality of the work that we're doing. But I think as part of David and Goliath, you always want to, um, attach yourself to the big guy and uh, you know we've done that really well and what's super funny is um, when you see the big incumbent who should never mention us spending money on billboards around you know I remember Sage and Intuit have done billboards around 
better support than zero, which is not true, but they spend their money talking about our brand in their home market, which is hilarious. That's pretty funny. Um, so Rich had a quick question around um, who's your primary competitor in Asia? Uh, it's not really a clear competitor in Asia. Um, MYB was the incumbent in Australia and New Zealand. We've passed them. Saves in the UK, we've passed them. We're bigger than twice the size of Intuit outside of the US. Um, and in the US, it's Intuit. Awesome. Um, so question, do you invest in other people's companies? Are you an angel investor that's active? And um, I guess what's some advice on what you would include in people's pitch decks to get funding? So I have, I've probably put half a million into various things and um, have been spectacularly unsuccessful. So I'm the world's worst angel investor. Um, and often those things, when you start them, um, you know, they kind of go off in a funny direction. So what, what I've, I don't think I've ever made any money from anyone else. I've just had to do it, do it on my own. So I'm a bit jaded on that. And it was interesting once um, Sam got his money from TradeMe, he invested in a whole lot of stuff. The problem with having the most money is you end up being the investor of last resort. So you end up kind of owning a big chunk of all of these things, which won't actually move the needle for you long term. So I'm all in on zero and that's all I think about. I'm pretty exposed to software. So I tend to launder my money through beach houses. Um, and what's your advice for, you must have seen plenty of pitch decks and I guess you guys are pretty awesome with messaging yourself and um, getting your own investment. So what's some of the core things that you would advise people to sort of include in their pitch deck or no-go areas? Yeah, so your pitch deck should be beautiful and convey the story very, very quickly. Um, and there's some really good tricks. One of the tricks that we use and have always used is having a plan that goes back a year and forward a couple of years and you show the things that you've already done. So today we are here and you've done this, 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 and this, and you're gonna do this, 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 and this. But also, because normally it takes six months at least to raise money. So when you see them at this, you know, at this point, when you go back and see them again later, you can say you've done that. I go, oh yeah, yeah, no, you've done that, tick, 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 so that's good. Um, another thing is doing a competitive landscape grid so that you plot yourself, because people are gonna want to understand that you understand the competitors in the market, but also orient them themselves. I oh, see so you like the Uber for food in this market. Oh, yeah, it's cool. So actually getting the landscape so you understand where you are is a really good trick to getting people up to speed. So when someone walks in, you have no idea what they're going to talk about. And the probability is 99% of them are going to have some stupid uh, assumption, which is wrong, because most of them don't get funded and all those. Only 1% ever get funded. So, um, and, and so your, your bias is, why am I doing this meeting? Um, I'm going to spot something really, really obvious. So if you can actually do the work around this is the um, competitive landscape I'm in, this is why others haven't been successful, and then what's in it for me? So the first part of it is investors want to go, oh, yeah, we got it. Yeah, they could do, oh, that's a good hypothesis, and there's some validation there. And then, then for them, what an investor wants to do is put their money out, put their money in, and get it out as fast as possible for as much as possible. So explaining the story of how they're going to do that is vital. So once you've ticked the first box of actually it's a good idea that could make money, thinking about it from their perspective of how they put money in and get money out is um, really sophisticated. Awesome, good answer. Um, who's, your, who's the most exciting partner that Zero has added to the ecosystem in the last few months? I love them all equally. Okay, there you go. Proud parent. Um, what are your guiding principles for engaging people you can trust um, to join Zero's family and other markets? Um, so I spend, uh, it's because we have an IPO, I've been working on the business rather than in the business. So the reason you see me waving my arms around and, and um, having fun with our competitors online is because I don't do any work. All of the actual work is done by people who have actual jobs. So my job is um, keeping an eye on the strategy, make sure everyone understands it. Um, you know, I turn up every so often for our investor days, which are quite good fun. But, um, but really, uh, I spend a lot of time talent pipelining. So finding really good people who's out there, you know, who's writing stories, who's speaking at conferences, who are, who are the thought leaders, who are the ass kickers and then try to get them into that into our business and quite often our business is quite conservative as it gets bigger so you actually have to fight to get people in even though you know they're the right person 
and you just want those people and you'll work out what they do later. So you spend a lot of time manufacturing and inventing jobs to get good people into the business and that usually works pretty well. Um, so I spent a lot of time uh, looking. We did actually um, hire a person who's our talent um, our talent mapper. So for some big roles that we put in place, it was worth actually having a person that's full time out there uh, building networks, looking at who's around and, and doing the science work on LinkedIn and, and racing around doing research to identify good talent you know, sort of 12 months down the track. So we do quite a bit of that. So on that note, I have a question from myself. Um, you know, watching companies go through the landing pad and you sort of get two types of founders, I've noticed. You get the founders who hold on to control of the business and that over time actually limits their ability to grow and scale exponentially. And then you get um, founders more like yourself, um, which I've seen a little bit rare, which kind of you let go of control. Um, you obviously drive the vision and everything, but you let go of certain aspects of control and then you hire really smart people around you. How did you sort of make that jump and shift in mindset to realize that that was the right way to go. And um, I think like culturally we also like struggle with letting go of that control. Yeah, I think having the attention span of a three year old is, um, you know, part of it. Um, are we done here? Oh, I'm back again. Um, you know, so I think getting bored easily once I can sort of see that something can be operationalized, then it's better for someone else to do it and they'll do a much better job. I kind of want to get on and fix and solve the next problem. So, um, uh, yeah, I think that's always been a big driver. If you want to move quick, it's about working on the business and getting the business operationalized as much as possible um, so that you can go and do the next exciting thing. So I think having a short attention span is a characteristic which drives that sort of behavior anyway. And my view is if you can, if people understand the mission, if you, you communicate it, it's incredibly powerful um, when they can just get on and make decisions. And it's so nice when somebody's made a decision and you know, hasn't asked for help or, or talk to a huge uh, committee, they just instinctively know that it's the right thing to do and, and they go and do it. I think a big thing too is, is like enjoying being wrong. So the way that I think about things is I have a model of how I think it works and you know, I, I still have RSS news feeds. Um, I use Feedly so I get lots and lots of um, news stories going through. So all of those little factoids, hundreds of factoids and all the social streams that you see every day are either confirming your model or giving you things to go, oh, that doesn't make sense. If things don't make sense, you'll either learn something new or there's an opportunity. And um, so you just see these patterns that become very, very clear. And after a period of time, you get a lot of confidence as you see these patterns play out. So there's not a lot of things that we do without, with massive risk because we've got so much conviction on this is where the industry is going, and we've had enough of those positive feedback cycles to make those, um, you know, to make those big calls. And I think that's a, a really big part of how um, of how we work is, you know, having a very clear vision of what's happened. And if, as a founder, if you see things that are inconsistent with that vision, then you go and fix it. Otherwise, it's all everything's just all go and all good. And then if some, I love it when someone stands up and says, Rod, you're wrong for these reasons. And you go, yep, that's logical, that's great. So whenever I'm wrong, I make a big song and dance about it because um, it empowers other people to know that they can be right. And if someone's got a good idea, then let's do the much better idea. So, you know, even being strategically wrong is quite a good weapon, I've found. And I guess um, as a founder, how do you actually communicate the vision? They um, At SASTA this year, they, they had this talk around how the CMOs had to kind of get the CEOs and the founders on board and then extrapolate all of the information and data out of their heads so they could go and run with the mission. How do you sort of communicate it so that everyone's across it and um, kind of lead people in that visionary thinking? So, so, you, so you're always communicating it? And what I find that we do is um, is keep pulling in people from teams. So as you get bigger, 1,700 people, people want to work in silos. So a lot of stuff that I do is just create meetings and pull people in from right throughout the business. So you keep playing back the same conversation. I have the same conversations every day, but to more and more people until it gets played back. And then I know that they're connecting the dots. So we, you know, we we you know have a formal strategy. It's all on a, it's all on um, on pages. We evolve it and we have clear language. So we're always linking things back to our priorities, our strategies, um, our values. So really being consistent with language. And if any sort of new thing comes up, always putting it back in the context of our overall strategy, or this is a, 
this was our strategy and we're now modifying it slightly with this new information, hence this new thing. So try not to be random with all the many ideas we can have and keep linkering it back to the known points where people are. And there was a really, um, one of my directors, uh, Pete Yarrell in Aftermail, um, you know, sat me down and gave me some good advice years ago, which was, Rod, sometimes, you know, if you're sort of charging ahead on the train, you've got to go back and, and connect all the carriages. And I think as a one of those sort of visionary charging CEOs, you do have to keep going back and make sure everyone's all connected as you bring them along on the journey. Awesome. A few more questions as well. So um, one from Henji. So Cami is a New Zealand-based startup, makes USA classrooms paperless. Um, they have 3 million users, 8K schools, um, 500 to a million ARR, nine people in launch three years ago. How did you figure out channel partnerships with accountants? Who were the first guys and how did you scale that? Uh, yeah, I think for the um, accounting industry, it's pretty obvious. You do any sort of research and accountants are the most trusted provider. And with our market, you know, it's sort of um, $50 a month product, you can't afford to sell everyone. It's just not cost effective. Whereas we can, each accountant has 300 customers, so we can afford to get their first 10 customers on board and then they'll give us customers later. So what we did was when we first started Zero, we brought a lot of accountants inside the tent and showed them what we were doing. So a lot of our local Wellington accountants and in two weeks, we actually had a, a 10 year foundation um, drinks and dinner to thank those accountants who were right with us at the very beginning of the journey. And when we first looked for customers, we said, hey, um, can we do an event in your offices to uh, show your customers, bring them in, and you know, there'll be some customers which will suit the stuff like, you know, uh, like web developers, those sort of customers. So we started selling to the accountants' customers, but we were doing all the work. And then that, then we sort of you know, stood back and we gave them playbooks to sell to their customers. So we demonstrated the interest in this to the accountant by selling to small to their customers while they could see it all happening. And then it just went on and on and snowballed from there. 140,000 accountant, accountants and bookkeepers on our platform now, which is nuts. Awesome, hope we answered your questions, guys. Um, so I actually want to, uh, how did you scale that is the follow-up question to that. Um, well, we we, add, we added lots of uh, salespeople um, to go and sell to accountants, and then we did uh, primarily a roadshow strategy. So um, we had a one of our strategies we called was recruit, educate, grow, and we used roadshows and webinars and our annual zero-con events to make those channels work. So the roadshows are generally free events, like in Australia, we'll do you know nine, fourteen cities, something like that. Our first ones would have had five people. And then, you know, last one we did in Perth was 900. I think we had 1,500 in Sydney and our most recent one, I can't remember the numbers exactly, but that's the order of magnitude. So those are generally free and they'll come for a day. And um, uh, so, so that evolved quite quickly. The recruit, educate, grow strategy was get people to their first, um, uh, their first roadshow. And then what you would see is the accountants all looking around at who else was there. Then they'd go onto the websites and see that they were people were starting to brand themselves up. They were productizing services, small, medium, and large bundles, and some of them were even starting to hire business development people. So we, we created competitive density uh, around those roadshows and those locations, and that got all accountants really starting to move on the journey. Which of course is much harder in the US, where you don't have that geographic density to the to the degree you do have in New Zealand, Australia, and the UK. And then you try to amplify that with um, you know, with on uh, with online stuff which is scalable and lots of nurture stuff where you give them lots of education. So accountants don't want to be sold to, but they'll take lots of education, certification, all of those things. So all those normal tricks, tricks that you would do uh, to build a scalable network, and that's been you know one of the secrets of our success. So much so that 90% of our customers are connected, certainly in Australia and New Zealand, are connected to accountants and bookkeepers. Um, and then I guess the question following that is, um, how do you measure it? Um, and I presume that sort of ROI on on leads and, and actually getting people top of funnel so then you can sort of um, educate them and move them through. Yeah, yeah and, and what investors liked in our last set of metrics was our um, customer acquisition costs, CAC had dropped on a per customer basis. So that shows that the strategy is working. I just see another few quick questions in multiple languages. Yeah, we've doing a lot of work around language at the moment, but we're not firing it quickly because we, um, we've got so much opportunity in our, in our existing markets, but all the new code we've written over the last year or two is very much multilingual. 
and then um, we'll, we will fire that at some point, but there's a whole lot of other costs that come in once you do that. And one of the benefits of being earlier stage and the incumbents is we can take our time because we've got so much opportunity in our existing markets. Um, someone measures something about our own deep learning framework. Now, the reason we moved to AWS was to get advantages of all those frameworks. And what we're seeing is machine learning is not one thing, it's a whole lot of different models and often all connected up together. So we can just basically configure through a web page and get access to a whole lot of cool machine learning stuff. And so we're doing a lot of experimenting with that and getting an amazing hit rate, which is quite exciting. Do you want to talk a little bit about the shiny stuff that you guys are doing and, um, you know, like where AI and, and um, machine learning fits into the platform and we can talk about bots and, um, I guess, growth hacking a little bit too? Yeah, so um, big thing that's keeping me exciting is the next wave of innovation. Now we're on AWS. Um, you know, we processed $1.4 trillion of transactions last year, so we have probably the biggest small business data set in the world, which of course fuels great data for machine learning. Um, and uh, what we've seen is that um, if someone can give us a digital document, we can code it better than a human now. So then the inference of that is, well, why are people even coding transactions? We notice that that as, um, you know, people, you know, like, like the landscape gardener is great at building tree houses, but they have no idea how to code their transactions, yet accounting software asks them to do it. So if we could um, eliminate coding, just give us the digital document and we'll code it for you and the accountant can fix it up if they need to, is, is a massive transformation because it greatly simplifies accounting and actually hits this fundamental untruth that um, we've worked out accounting is actually pretty hard for most mortals. So let's have them not do it. Commercially, that means if you think about the market for accounting software, desktop software in, in any mature market only got to 10, 12% market share, it was too hard. Um, cloud software is, you know, it's a bit better designed, even though it's doing the same sort of functionality, but because it's better designed with better onboarding, just because of the generations of us that are building the stuff, um, we're getting over half of our customers new, New Zealand's 33%, so maybe you get 40 or 50% of the market with easier to use accounting software. But if you're not doing accounting, maybe that's how you get all those spreadsheet users, the other 50% of the market. So our, our vision is that um, by delivering code-free accounting, we can open up that massive bit of the market where accounting is just too hard. Awesome, that's super cool. Um, how do you handle the movement of people who are only suited, uh, suited um, at particular stages of growth and maturity? Um, well, we're pretty active. I think if you're a public company and your results are about every six months, then you've got to make moves. So one of the you know interesting things about zero and hard things about zero is, you know, we we do we are growing so quickly that there may be people that were great at a certain level, but then they're probably not the right people for the next level. So we tend to have those conversations um, pretty pretty early, and um, for people that haven't been the right people for zero. Uh, usually they're valued inside our network, so we actually help them to get their next job, to keep their career moving. So we care about all of our family. And, um, you know, there's lots of people that we've, um, well, yeah, not lots, but a few people who, you know, uh, where we're at just isn't the right place for them. And they may be halfway to where they need to be, but if we're going to replace them, it's going to get rid of the job that they have. So we tend to be very human about that, make sure they're not financially affected too much. and. Um, are very positive and proactive about getting them into their next opportunity and it's exciting to see how they flourish. Um, or we get people to you know, change careers inside the, inside the business. So uh, quite a few people sort of bounce around a bit until they find their thing and then they're off and running. And uh, the other thing is sometimes we have to hire over the top and while that can be traumatic, um, almost probably nine times out of 10, the feedback a few months later is, oh, I'm enjoying work so much more that I'm actually learning from somebody so all of those dynamics are something that we care with all care about all the time and uh, working on all the time. Awesome. Um, Tom has a question around um, motivation and staff. So how do you keep a team motivated and balance expectations for an exit opportunity? And when do you know um, if the timing is right? So um, the benefit about being public is you don't need to have an exit. So I mean, there there, there might be somebody might come and buy all of us, but it's not really what we're seeking. Um, with a public company, there's a liquidity. So some of our early staff have sold shares, paid for their houses, and super exciting when all of that happens, and we, we, we really celebrate that. So cool. Um, for, in a private company, that's one of the issues, is that you tend, you tend to drive to a, 
a liquidity event. And in New Zealand, certainly the investment market is not that sophisticated. So they're a bit nervous about founders taking money off the business, and taking money out of the business in a funding round. Um, but what we're seeing now is a bit more sophistication around that, where if you, you know, do have a large chunk and you haven't had a payday yet, um, sometimes you've got to just, you know, put a bit of, take a, take a bit off the table, um, builds a bit more uh, liquidity in the stock. And it means the founder can, you know, go home and say to their partner, um, you know, I've been working hard, but at least we can, you know, our, our mortgage has come down slightly. So I think there's a bit more sophistication around that uh, liquidity when you raise money. Um, but it's still probably fairly, you know, it's still generally frowned on. Um, but we are, it is getting a bit more um, acceptable now. Um, yeah, so New Zealand's probably one of the worst countries for that. You know, I've managed to, to sell a few shares on the way and it makes it so much better if you've taken some risk off and you're keeping the, keeping the family happy and you can enjoy the benefits of, of the, the good work you've done to date. Um, you know, I think it drives, you know, much, much happier founders and takes, takes some pressure off. So getting that balance right is key. But um, you know, quite a lot of people say, "Why well, you, you know, is it good running a public company?" Well, the the rewards are uh, potentially huge, but the good thing is that your valuation isn't isn't artificial. It's something that you can actually control by your the perceptions of the company and the quality and the interactions that people have, as well as the financial metrics. So it's quite direct. And you know, one of the things I worked out pretty early on was. If you wanted to be really rich, owning a chunk of a of a public company through a high growth phase is a, is a way that is a way to create wealth. And um, so, I guess I personally kind of hacked that to to make it happen. And um, that was a really interesting thought experience from an entrepreneur. So you see these patterns going on, and then um, you know put a strategy in place for that to happen, which uh, you know has, has has worked out great. And then you can apply all those sort of internal hacking things to your own business which is you know one of the things that we're doing now because as businesses get bigger you normally see a growth decay and um, what's important is to make sure you keep getting internet economics over your business so that's one of the things that keeps me really excited at the moment thinking about how do we hack our business now from a million to two million customers as fast as we can. So if you're like kind of with Aftermail, your decision to sell was based on the fact that you, there was a different opportunity waiting in a larger market segment and that it was better to sell sort of then at that point in time and then trans transition into something different. Yeah, and also a bit of founder, founder uh, dynamics. I mean, we had great people with Aftermail, but they weren't really my normal tribe of people. So we had a few tensions and... So if we raised a whole lot of money, we'd all be working together and those tensions would have, you know, been there and probably got worse. Whereas for us, the people factors were a, were, were a good reason for, um, for selling the business at that point in time as well. So, you know, we're all good mates and it was good fun, but they, they weren't the normal people that I, that, that, um, I would normally work with because they were all busy when we started it. So when we started Zero, uh, for those people that, you know, I've, I've built a history with before, I went and made sure, come and you can't miss this one, you have to get on board. So I managed to get most of the people on board. So a good example of that is Tony Stewart, who was one of my original um, founders, you know, back when, some, when I was in my 20s and when we started Glazier Systems. And Tony kept running Intergen or what became that. And I think he's one of the smartest guys in the New Zealand tech scene. So uh, I was waiting and waiting and waiting. And he finally sold that business. And um, you know, within a month or so, he managed to get him back on and reform the band. So being able to work with people that you really respect and you're on the same wavelength with is, makes things a whole lot more fun, but also a lot less stressful and I think you can just go faster. Um, I kind of want to talk, um, we've got like maybe five minutes um, and appreciate you coming on today. Um, so just about you, I guess, being a founder, um, sort of how do you, um, so you decided to build from Wellington and the Hawke's Bay and that was a personal choice and I guess you're doing a pretty good job given that the new building is like almost ready and that's pretty exciting to see. Um, how do you sort of think outside the box and sort of, you know, if you're giving all the time as a founder, how do you make sure you get the nourishment you need and also where do you actually get it from in terms of like your intellectual conversations and, and keeping on top of like what's coming? Um, so, yeah, so I, I think, you know, we have people in our business right through all levels of the business that really get it. So, you know, you naturally build those relationships, you get a lot of that internally. And then if you do find people from, from other companies, 
um, you know, you, you, you look forward to those interactions. And, you know, people, a lot of the CEOs share a lot of stuff. I just had a, had a, had a text from Mike Cannon-Brooks yesterday around some stuff. He just wanted to benchmark some policies they were doing. So just ping it straight back on a text. So there's lots of support in the network. And, you know, a lot of us, you know, we, we're all time poor, so we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So we ask for help quite often. And um, I think when you find people that are stimulating and push back and have a good perspective, those are the people that are really interesting. Sort of some tips on that networking, you know, I'll come and see, you know, I'll see one of my, my staff and I'll say, hey, Rod, how are you? I'm like, it doesn't really matter, does it? Um, uh, you know, ask me a question or something that's um, something which is, which is really quite relevant. You know, you've got 50 people asking, how are you? It gets a bit tiring. But if someone says, hey, Rod, I've got a problem. Well, what do you think? That's really interesting. So asking questions is um, a great way to connect um, and just get to it because, you know, you really don't have time for pleasantries when you've got lots of people. So there's this, as you get to a certain size, there's this asymmetry where everyone wants to talk to you, but you kind of heard every conversation that, uh, unless someone really blows you away. And that's really interesting. So um, engaging in something which is far more interesting. So think about that perspective if you want to network with important people ask them a question, which is makes them think and go, oh yeah, I can actually add some value there. You know, chit chat, isn't that interesting? We're all too busy. Sorry if that sounds harsh. Um, valuable though. And um, you just got a good insight there, folks. Um, and what's some of the advice for founders and teams um, who don't know what they don't know and um, what sort of things should they be focusing on to get ahead of the curve? Um, well, I, I think building your mental model. So in your industry, um, you know, building that model of how you think it work, who are the key people, you know, get to see them. So one of the things that we did with Aftermail, we knew that getting on the Gartner Madrid quadrant was really important and getting the analysts understanding. So who are the analysts? Can you ring them up? Are they speaking at a conference? Can you meet them face to face? Can you ask them out for lunch? Um, you know, I was pretty ruthless at that networking. So for us, you know, you do all the things. Like I remember um, going to the Angel Investment Conference before we raised any money. So I was thinking about, well, where's all the money? Oh, all those people all together, they have a conference. And I joked, I was at, uh, they had, a, had an event at Black Barn and when I got up and speak, I said, oh, I'm so disappointed there's no cheeky founders here. You know, any cheeky founder would have um, done the mapping and worked out that, uh, you know, all, all the money was gonna be at an event in, um, Corks Bay for two or three days, that's where you want to be, right, to build that relationship. The money you're going to raise in New Zealand will be from people in that room. So working out how to blag your way in or speak at it or do something like that, that's the sort of stuff that I did, you know, 12, 15 years ago. Good tip. That's something I do in the US. It's like nothing else matters apart from how you get in the room. Um, yeah. Okay, last question that I'm going to do is um, New Zealand. Um, what What's your... What's your hopes for New Zealand um, having kind of come on this journey so far? And you obviously have a lot of influence on sort of the economic um, or the economy now and the people in it. Yeah, so you go through a point of caring and then not caring. So what I'm seeing is it's our time um, that uh, after TPP fell over and with the American stuff, it just shows we're out on our own and we should compete and you don't have to bring everyone with you. The best thing is just go and do it and others will learn from your experience and work out who else is doing it and uh, work alongside them. You know, it's such a great opportunity. I mean, even just simple things like, I'm just um, uh, signed up to a new broadband plan that's basically a gigabit internet in the provinces. Anyone in Australia would think you're crazy having that sort of internet. Um, you know, we have all the food and cafes. You can jump on a plane and get to these places and build relationships with people overseas. Everyone in the US and the tech industry has a fantasy relationship with New Zealand, so they're interested that you're from New Zealand, but they don't really care where you're from because they're operating all over the world. So it just feels like before you had to go to the US and, you know, you had to go and do those things. Now you can actually build amazing global businesses with the safety, the food, the relaxed lifestyle and all that stuff that we have here. And uh, it feels like the prize, sort of no compromise work while, while you're still largely based here. And yes, you jump on a plane and do those things, but you know, it's pretty cool living in, living in Hawke's Bay and uh, you know, bouncing down to Wellington every week is awesome. Awesome. I am gonna wrap that up for the people who we didn't answer your questions. I can probably get them answered um, while I'm in Wellington and offline. Uh, so thanks so much for joining us today. Um, anything else you wanna say, Rob? 
Um, yeah, the name zero. There's a blog on that. You can work that one out. Let's go through the questions. Uh, covered language. How do you measure ROI of those webinars or conference? Actually, Sh um, Shanzi, the person of that, she's really clever with uh, running webinars, but being really scientific about everything. So having clear set of, a clear funnel, and and having clear funnel metrics, and making sure that everyone's lined up on getting to those funnel metrics. So if you're doing uh, your webinars, um, how many people are you getting? Is it growing every week? So are you doing the right sort of uh, marketing of your, of your webinars and, and a webinar becomes a key event. So you should be tracking that success and then tracking the net promoter score of that. So are you meeting expectations and all those things? And I think Sean's probably the expert on all of those sort of things, but that's what we think of now is trying to meet at everything because you've only got so much time. So you want to make sure everything you do, every bit of work everybody does is contributing towards the mission. And I've got to, as we get bigger, making sure that people just aren't doing doing uh, work so they feel like they're busy. I've got to know that they're actually driving towards an outcome and that's a, a big part of what I do now is, is really pushing that message. Anyway, thanks everybody. Really appreciate your time. Awesome. Thanks so much guys and uh, we'll see you I think next week for another webinar. Cool. Have a good day.